Hi, good morning. Wow, okay, that's a little loud. Um, my name is Jonathan Shanzer. I'm Senior Vice President for Research at Foundation for Defense of Democracies. It's good to see so many uh, staffers and government officials, members of the Diplomatic Corps here this morning. Thank you for joining uh, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies uh, on Capitol Hill. FDD, as you may know, is a nonpartisan policy institute focused on national security. And today, our conversation with members of Congress, FDD experts, and distinguished other speakers will address one of the more timely national security issues. Uh, and there are lots of reasons it's a timely issue, chiefly among them that Congress just a few days ago uh, marked up the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Amendments Act. HIFPA II, as we would call it, uh, of 2017, updating the prior Hezbollah bill, both of which look at Hezbollah activities worldwide and aim to curb, curb the threat posed by the organization. Some have called the bill Hezbollah Inc. because of our, uh, as our speakers will discuss today, it operates on many levels as a terrorist organization, as a transnational criminal organization, and often as businesses masking their financial, uh, their financing of malign activities. Today we're going to have both uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Royce and Ranking Member Elliot Engel uh, to uh, speak with us. They have recognized this threat together in a bipartisan manner and have championed Congress's activity on this issue. Unfortunately, Chairman Royce is running a little bit behind schedule, so he'll be joining us uh, uh, as we're already into the program, but he will be joining us shortly. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, today with uh, our panel, uh, a panel that I'm going to actually be taking part on. This is a little bit weird, but uh, we didn't have an MC today, so I'm doubling up. Uh, so I want to introduce Joyce Karam, who I've known for 17 years or something. Uh, she is the Washington Bureau Chief for Al Hayat Newspaper, one of the leading uh, daily pan-Arab newspaper. She writes for The National, uh, which is a Gulf-based uh, language, uh, English language news service, and uh, she's been reporting from the U.S. for a number of years, but she is a uh, Lebanese native. So, Joyce, I'm going to have you um, kick us off. Thanks for joining us. timely event. Uh, I have to say, growing up in Lebanon, I really never understood the full scope of uh, Hezbollah. Uh, in the 80s and in the 90s, it was branded as a resistance group. But then after the Israeli withdrawal in 2000, it kept its arms. Uh, it also had a lot of social services. It had a lot of fiery speeches against uh, <coughs> The United States, Death to America chants were often heard on TV when you're watching uh, the, uh, the, the, the nightly news. Uh, and uh, moving to 2005, the first time that Hezbollah entered government, its, uh, its portfolio just kept expanding. Uh, today, as you're going to hear from our panelists, the party operates uh, militarily actively in, uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, also operates underground, uh, for example, in Bahrain, in Kuwait, and other Gulf countries. Uh, with me to discuss all of this and the broad network of the party is really a, um, a phenomenal panel with uh, excellent expertise on the, on the topic. Uh, to my uh, right is Derek Maltz, 28-year veteran of uh, the DEA, having served as the special agent in charge of the U.S. Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration, and Special Operations uh, Division. Uh, he uh, established the Counter-Narco-Terrorism Operations Center in January 2007. Uh, a lot of significant operations, among them I think you might have heard, is the identification of the Lebanese Canadian Bank as a facilitator involved with an international trade-based money laundering scheme supporting Hezbollah. Uh, that operation and a subsequent U.S. Treasury Patriot Act uh, 311 action uh, led to a $150 million seizure. Uh, to, to his right is uh, Yaya Fanusi, uh, the author of uh, an FDD report on uh, illicit uh, uh, network and funding uh, for Hezbollah. 
Prior to that, uh, Yaya served as an analyst in the uh, CIA. He also briefed uh, President Bush and members of the administration often uh, once uh, in 2008. And to his uh, right is John uh, Jonathan uh, Schanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He's part of the leadership uh, team of FDD Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. He previously worked as terrorism finance analyst uh, at uh, U.S. Department uh, of Treasury, and his, I can attest, he's been studying and writing uh, about uh, the region for over two uh, decades. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I want this to be as interactive as possible, so just apologies in advance if I'm going to be interrupting uh, a lot. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, John. So. <coughs> Can you, uh, having, you know, at FDD tracked the conversions of Hezbollah's illicit networks and Iran, uh, can you just give us uh, with more detail about this confluence uh, of networks and what can be done to, to counter Hezbollah's growth, given, may I say, that sanctions have been there since Hezbollah almost came uh, came to being so and and Hezbollah is only expanding so what has worked what could work sure. <clears throat> hello okay there you go um, thank you Joyce uh, thanks again for joining us um, so uh, Hezbollah has been sanctioned for uh, for several decades now. Obviously, the group came into uh, into being in the early 1980s, uh, but I think the sanctions program that we have had has really been uh, it's been evolving. I don't think it's been as effective in targeting uh, terrorist organizations until probably the, uh, the perhaps the years after 9/11, the with the advent of targeted financial sanctions, where we could go and specifically target elements within the organization. So uh, even as we designated uh, uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, uh, even as we looked at its, uh, its role with Iran in the early years, there was uh, little to be done. And I would say that this is largely the case with a lot of the other sanctions programs that we had in place. Um, I think that uh, after 9-11 and, and the evolution of Treasury sanctions tools, you could go after the specific uh, individuals, you could go after the specific companies, uh, charities, and, uh, and, and illicit businesses that Hezbollah uh, has owned or controlled. And so there's where we saw some of the real evolution. Now, I think over the last uh, couple of years, specifically with the passage of HIFPA in 2015, uh, there uh, appeared to be a more concerted effort on the part of the U.S. government. I think part of that had to do, uh, or a lot of it, had to do with the fact that you had the recent release of uh, billions of dollars to Iran, knowing that some of that money was going to flow into the coffers of Hezbollah. Uh, this, I think, motivated uh, Congress and to, to pass new legislation to make it harder uh, for Hezbollah to move money. And so there was uh, this uh, tightening. And now we have, again, the passage of HIFPA II, which I think even goes further and, and specifically targets uh, state sponsors uh, of Hezbollah. And I think that that is a clear nod to, uh, to Iran. Uh, and I think as we've seen in recent uh, months, there have been significant reports of, uh, of Iranian funding to Hezbollah that out of the roughly billion dollar budget, and yeah, yeah, we'll talk about this, but out of that billion dollar budget, um, and I would say that's back of the envelope, it's not like uh, Hezbollah's kind of um, uh, going to Ernst & Young at the end of every year to settle up on their taxes, but we have uh, a sense that it's around a billion dollars, and, and more than $800 million of that comes from Iran, so there needs to be uh, a mechanism for stopping those funds in particular, and I think that this is more important now than it ever has been, as you see Hezbollah uh, extending into uh, other parts of the Middle East beyond Lebanon, uh, fighting uh, on the ground in Syria, um, advising various uh, terrorist organizations, including the Houthis in Yemen, uh, extending into places like Latin America, as my colleague uh, Emanuele Otolenghi has talked about. So what you see now is uh, a, um, 
a concerted effort to crack down on this organization, uh, particularly as Iran grows in its um, uh, in its in its attempts to uh, uh, to establish hegemony in the Middle East. Uh, but again, I mean, I'm going to go to Yaya on this uh, on your report and then just follow up on on this point. I mean, you know, uh, you mentioned that the funding for Hezbollah is now roughly billion dollars. That that's a very big spike from the uh, 200 million we used to hear about uh, a few years uh, back. So what makes you think that, I mean, given that I don't think uh, Hassan Nasrallah or others in the party are using PayPal or credit card or uh, <laughs> doing Equifax uh, <laughs> reviews, so uh, it, w why will U.S. sanctions work uh, against uh, the party, and you mentioned in the report that the money comes mostly in, in cash or through other uh, outlets. So how vulnerable is Hezbollah to sanctions, and why did Iran increase uh, the funding? Is it the nuclear deal that John spoke about, or the political <coughs> expansion of uh, Iran in the region? Um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, it, it's obviously, as you pointed to, right, we don't know uh, the inner, all the inner workings of, of Hezbollah's funding. Um, but we do know, I think, there are three key things. We can get into, like, what sanctions can do uh, or, or have been doing and, and what they can do even better. Um, but there are sort of three, uh, uh, three pieces to Iranian, to Hezbollah funding. First one, Iran, right, Iran's state sponsorship. And then I'd say the criminal enterprises and donations. So you have to look at sort of these three separate areas. Um, Hezbollah has been successful in sort of withstanding a lot of the pressure, right? And as you mentioned, right, they've been sanctioned for over 20 years, designated as an FT, as a foreign uh, terrorist organization. Actually, a, uh, it'll be 20 years on Sunday. That'll be the anniversary of their designation as an FTO. Um, and they're still making about roughly a billion dollars. I think the key word to understand with Hezbollah is, is leverage. That's how they're able to sort of e evolve and sort of withstand. Um, and I know others will, will, will talk later. They leverage their, uh, their community abroad. They leverage the, dias the Lebanese diaspora uh, through uh, extortion, through front companies. Um, so they, they leverage the, the criminal networks that are out there, right? What do they bring to the table? They bring they bring their network. They bring the ability to, to bring cash to other parts of the world, to bring dr drugs to other parts of the world. Um, so you really have those, you know, the, the, the criminal element, the Iran element, and then you have the, the donations, right, which they do internally and externally, right? Again, still leveraging um, their uh, their diaspora for, for much of it, and this image that they have, this image of being a, uh, that they portray themselves as a, as you mentioned, a resistance organization and the like. So what can uh, sanction do I'd say that you know the the key issue is seeing um, seeing Hezbollah cohere having a coherent strategy and you know I, I like the example of you know if you're going to go against the Cleveland Cavaliers right in basketball um, you know you've got to sort of attack their players right you have to you know, have a sort of full full court press but you're not going to get anywhere if you don't deal with LeBron James. LeBron James, you know, you can do everything on all these other players, but you've got to deal with LeBron James if you're going to impact the Cleveland Cavaliers. In this analogy, LeBron James would be Iran. Uh, Derek, you've, uh, you've worked on Hezbollah. You've, uh, you were the architect of the Lebanese-Canadian uh, bank case. Uh, how how do, you, do you see the United uh, States government now uh, equipped uh, in in uh, fighting uh, Hezbollah's finances? Well, thanks to the support from Chairman Royce and Ranking Member Engel, I mean, we've seen a lot of progress, but there's a lot of work to be done. When you have people chanting death to America, that's some serious stuff, right? The consequences are really significant for this country. So we need a lot more action and a lot less words, okay? So we've had some interagency task force success. As a matter of fact, there was a nice article written in some congressional report, um, I believe Senator Feinstein um, wrote the article or authored the article where they cited the Lebanese-Canadian bank investigation on the Project Cassandra 
as a model for success for interagency operations. Even though DEA was an active participant, that case was a success because of the tools of national power for the U.S. government to pull all the expertise together in one interagency task force. So you think an agent like myself from the DEA had any idea the impact of a 311 action? I had no idea, but I learned from Treasury's finest. I learned from Dr. Asher, some of the, the best in the, in, the, in the country. So we have to start listening to these experts, and we have to learn what works, what doesn't work. We know that drugs are generating, according to the UN, and I'm not a big statistics guy, $400 billion a year. And we know, according to every leader of government seems to be saying, that criminals, I mean, terrorists are turning to criminal networks for their funding, right? So you have to have these interagency task forces. So with the Lebanese Canadian Bank success, even though it was a successful initiative, it was just a drop in a bucket. We need to get like 30 or 50 of these things going. And there needs to be consequences for the countries that are not cooperating. One last thing on that question. You talk about cash, right? One of my lines that I've used in the past is you're not going to pay these corrupt officials with Visa, PayPal, or MasterCard. You're going to pay with a suitcase of cash, and that's what they do. Okay, so in that tri-border region, they're getting paid off with cash, and we need to be more aggressive and shut down their ability to move the money around the globe, just like we did in the LCB case. Excellent. We have the uh, Chairman Royce joining us now. So, uh, John. Uh, yeah. oh, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, sorry, again, wearing two hats today. Uh, so, uh, obviously, everyone knows that uh, um, the Chairman Royce is uh, the Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, he's also a senior member of the House uh, Financial Services Committee. Uh, his leadership in the creation of the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Act of 2015 and the follow-on legislation being marked up is a true testament to his commitment to counter Hezbollah. He has shown remarkable leadership in Congress, and FDD has been honored to work with him and his staff on a range of issues over the years. Chairman Royce, thank you for being with us. Well, today. thank you, and I appreciate um, the panel here. And Derek, thank you for your obvious observations, but it's one that uh, Americans need to familiarize themselves more with. Uh, we have a regular dialogue going on with our European counterparts uh, about the real nature of Hezbollah and the real nature of uh, terror finance out there. And I think there's not uh, the recognition of what the costs, what the consequences uh, have been. Uh, for 35 years now, Hezbollah has been on the move. And in terms of uh, its motivation, its fealty to uh, the Ayatollah, its cult-like uh, dedication to assassination, uh, it has cost the United States uh, 241 Marines back in 1983, another 19 Marines uh, in 1996, uh, and in between, a whole host of casualties around the globe, from, from Argentina to Bulgaria to... Uh, uh, well, certainly Israel. And as we watch the attempts to put cocaine on our streets, which, by the way, successful attempts, as we watch their efforts to basically morph into just, not just a terrorist or organization, but a full-time criminal enterprise, uh, it's obvious that we have not effectively rallied the international community. Now, we do have tools, we have legislation that uh, the feedback we get have, have crimped their financing more than any problem that they've, uh, that they've been in before in terms of getting their hands on cash. But we have got to double down in particular on the money that's coming in from Iran and coming in from Syria. We have got to double down in terms of making the illegal the crowdsourcing methodology from small donors that they've been able to use. This legislation that we're, that we're moving now, 3329, has a whole series of steps to try to close any last loopholes that remain for this criminal enterprise, and it labels them a criminal enterprise in a way which will help us with respect to our European and um, Latin American uh, uh, friends and allies. It gives us additional leverage, shall we say, to help force every other, not just financial institution, we're doing that now, 
We're not doing it enough, as Derek points out, but we're doing it now worldwide. But we need additional tools to foreclose the ability to get to get that cash. Why? I had an opportunity to see what they do with it uh, back during the Second Lebanon War. I was in Haifa. And at the Rambam Trauma Hospital, every day they bring in additional casualties of the Hezbollah uh, rockets that were being fired. Now, they could have done none of this, by the way, on their own, because, frankly, the ID badges uh, after the conflict was over, after the, their positions were overrun, the, the ID badges showed that the officer corps were uh, Iranians. The rank and file, yeah, they were, they were Lebanese Hezbollah, but the officers were Iranians. And you can bet when you were seeing uh, short of ship missiles being fired, that's the expertise of the, Iran of the Iranians. You can bet also that the intelligence that they had uh, been able to apply uh, that told them to, feed, to, to dig 10 meters deep for their tunnels when the ordinance would go 9 meters, that's not something the, uh, the Lebanese Hezbollah figured out on their own. Again, that's a Iranian, that was Iranian information, and that's what allowed them basically for their tunneling capacity. When, when we were watching those rockets come into Haifa, there were 10,000 10, left in inventory. Today, there's probably 140,000 at least. So the other aspect of this, as I say, is not just on sanctioning Iran, but making certain that our friends and allies in the region have the capability to block the transference of these missiles uh, that they seek to transfer through Syria into the hands of Hezbollah. Why? Because the next generation of Hezbollah weaponry is going to be focused on precision guided. There, there were dumb rockets when I were there that were slamming into Haifa. Now these are going to be GPS capable. Uh, now my friends on both sides of the aisle will tell you the talking points during the debate said that this was not going to be allowed, this kind of transference. There were going to be limitations on all of this, conventional and ballistic missiles. What we're focused on right now is how you ramp up the ballistic missile sanctions, how you ramp up the terror uh, finance sanctions on Iran, how you ramp up uh, with this legislation, its support for groups like Hezbollah. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to say to all of you, thank you uh, for giving us a forum to talk about some of these issues to better educate the, uh, the public about the reality uh, of uh, Hezbollah and uh, also about the costs in human lives uh, of our Marines that have lost their lives, the people on the streets from drugs who lose their lives, and of the targets of assassination uh, around the world by Hezbollah as well as civilians in, in Israel who have been targeted. Uh, and let's, let's close with this reality as well. We're in a circumstance today where we see these uh, Hezbollah manufacturing plants being set up in southern Lebanon uh, and, by the way, in Syria across the border from Israel. And the intent of these manufacturing uh, firms are to, the, the Iran is paying for them, is to generate the production of more missiles locally. These have to be taken out. And uh, one of them recently was taken out. Uh, I can only speculate by whom, uh, but uh, just as it was important, just as it was important to take out the capability in Syria some years ago of the nuclear weapons uh, program that was uh, constructed by North Korea, you can imagine where we would be today if it had not been taken out, because that particular area on the Euphrates River where that plant used to exist for the uh, capability for nuclear weapons uh, for Syria, you would have you would have Hezbollah fighting over that site, with Al Nusra fighting for that site, with ISIS 
trying to get a hold of that inventory, uh, etc. This is why this issue is so important. We're dealing with a terrorist organization that's simply an extension of Iran. Uh, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, this is... Uh, some very serious allegations against uh, uh, Hezbollah. Your, uh, the, the legislation you're sponsoring, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, do you expect it to, to go for a House vote anytime soon? And from that, do you expect the Senate to put amendments uh, on it, the HEFPAC to, uh, and the President to, to sign it? Well, the, the prior piece of legislation we've had uh, on Hezbollah finance uh, to designate it as a terrorist organization received uh, bipartisan support. We were able to pass it through relatively quickly through the House. We got it through the Senate and to the President's desk. Uh, right now we're putting a lot of pressure on the Senate. We, we've got the support, Elliot Engel and I have the support lined up from a, for our legislation here on the House side. We think it'll be quickly signed. Then it goes to the issue that Derek was talking about, which is enforcement and how robust that enforcement is going to be. Uh, and it has to be full throttle. What do you call that? Gauge eight. It's got to be. It, it's got to be uh, uh, ramped up. Uh, this has to be our focus right now. We've got to enforce the hell out of every single sanctions provision we have, and on every agreement we have vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah and Iran. Thank you. For uh, just, if I can follow up very quickly, for those in Lebanon, at the central bank, at other institutions that are worried that this legislation might backfire and hurt uh, the Lebanese institutions, any any assurance? Uh, I've had long conversations with um, the government from uh, Lebanon on this, and from uh, uh, pre and with President Harari. Let, let me say this: uh, these conversations would probably be uh, more uh, uh, more impactful to me and my colleagues if we didn't have uh, an agent of uh, Hezbollah sitting in the room when we have them. And this is one of the great misgivings I have about Lebanon allowing Hezbollah into the government. And I will also share with you, I had an opportunity to meet with about 40 uh, Lebanese Americans um, of, of every uh, political uh, perspective, but all coming to one conclusion. And that is, it is a great tragedy to have Hezbollah in the government in Lebanon. Uh, that was their unanimous concurrence, uh, the discussion I had with them about a week ago, and uh, it's one that I share. Thank you. I, th I think I'd better go to uh, the conference meeting. But, I think uh, we, we but will thank allow, you all very we'll much. allow him to do that. Okay. Right yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so very much. On that note, um, so John, uh, we're also 12, uh, almost 12 days away from the uh, Trump administration rolling out a new strategy, a new review, a new something we, we report about uh, on, Ir on Iran. Uh, what do you expect from this review to do on, on the issue of Hezbollah? Uh, on Iran's proxies, other proxies in, in places like Syria and, uh, and Iraq? <coughs> well, uh, uh, how would I put this? That, uh, the review is, is obviously nearly complete. The, I would say that most of the debate has been about whether or not uh, uh, the president recertifies um, uh, or, or whether he decertifies, and I think that's going to be the, the primary concern right now is, is uh, the nuclear deal. Um, what I would say, though, is that there does appear to be a significant part of this strategy which is designed to roll back the influence of Iran's proxies, uh, and that 
will almost certainly include Hezbollah. Uh, obviously, there's been a, a significant debate about what happens with the fall of ISIS. Uh, that uh, with the fall of ISIS, without a strategy in place to keep Hezbollah in check, then what you're we're eff effectively doing is ceding uh, the territory uh, to Iran, and that is unacceptable. And so uh, I believe there is a, sort of a scramble right now uh, to try to figure out uh, how to keep Hezbollah further in check there. I think that it's probably more of a military strategy than a financial one, which could stray a bit from the conversation that we're having today. Um, but that is obviously due to the fact that Hezbollah is now the largest fighting force uh, in Syria on behalf of Iran and the Assad regime. But, uh, but to follow up, I mean, does the administration have uh, any leverage uh, on the ground at a point where you see Iran is almost very dominant in, in Syria and in, uh, in Iraq. The Syrian opposition is, you know, barely hanging to few areas in the north and in the south. So absent of a big U.S. military push, who would do the fighting? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're asking all the right questions where I think the answers are still unclear. We I, Obviously, we've been looking at the Kurds, which has been complicated by the recent referendum. Uh, we've looked at uh, other factions which have been tainted by um, uh, allegations of extremists from within. Uh, there is... Um, uh, there's obviously the complication of uh, the uh, artist formerly known as the Nusra Front now, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, effectively um, inheriting the, uh, the strongest position among Sunni jihadi groups with the fall, expected fall of ISIS. So um, these are all creating significant complications. I think the administration's uh, focus on the IRGC is going to be significant. Obviously, the IRGC is the, pr is the uh, dominant engine uh, behind the Shiite forces inside Syria. So there is some financial strategies there. But really, again, we are looking at a question of whether or not the United States is willing to deploy military assets to counter Iran after the fall of ISIS. And I think this is something that we, we should hear something about after the review is complete. Uh, Yahya, sorry, yeah, yeah, not Yahya, never mind. You can say Yahya. <laughs> well, since we're talking about Hezbollah, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, do, do you see the administration returning to, to a Bush uh, strategy? Is that where we are today? Um, I don't know. Uh, um, you know, uh, and I can't, I, I probably can't answer the military side of it, uh, but I can say a little something about uh, the financial strategy. I mean, you know, there's the issue of, you know, how do we, how do you contain Iran or how do you deal with Iran? And there, there are some things that, that are possible. I mean, for instance, um, we talk about in our, in our, in our report, um, uh, how does Iran provide funding? It provides funding predominantly off the books through uh, parastatals and sort of charitable organizations that are really controlled by Iran's supreme leader. Um, and again, these are off the books, right? So, so, but they're managed by different c uh, commercial enterprises and conglomerates. And in the run-up to the JCPOA, for example, take one, one organization, ICO, um, which of course is sanctioned as sort of being part of the Iranian government, um, secondary sanctions were taken off as sort of a sweetener to the deal. Uh, but if you really look at it, you can still target that organization or entities within that organization for their funding role to Hezbollah, terrorism sanctions. You use the same sanctions that we've, we've had since after 9-11, right, to go after terrorist financing. But can, can this be done without decertification of the deal, or do you need decertification to... Uh, I for Congress to move. So I don't think so. I mean, and I'll, I'll let our, you know, our, our experts on, on the JCPOA chime in. But um, no, I, it, I don't think it's an issue because we're talking about terrorist, uh, uh, the terrorist sanctions that are totally separate from the nuclear sanctions. Uh, Derek, uh, Chairman Royce was speaking about narcotics, Hezbollah as a criminal uh, organization. You've, you've monitored this closely. How dependent is Hezbollah, uh, you know, and its cash uh, revenue on uh, drug trafficking or uh, cigarettes or, or other illicit activities, whether in Latin America, uh, Africa, or other areas we hear about? Okay, so actively, you know, DEA and other agencies have investigations of major drug trafficking, multi-ton quantities of cocaine leaving. South America going into uh, Europe, 
into Lebanon, into Australia. By the way, you know how much it uh, sells for cocaine in Australia? About $250,000 a kilogram. This is about making money, right? How do you make money and reduce your risk? You send your drugs to areas of the world that do not have strong law enforcement like the United States of America, okay? So, going back to the question, uh, we've had a lot of success uh, considering how difficult it is to infiltrate these organizations in the tri-border region, as an example, because of the corruption, the extent of the corruption is through the roof. And in Venezuela, what about what we were dealing with in Venezuela? Cargo planes leaving, protected by military, going all over West Africa, okay? And then these extremist groups moving to cocaine all over West Africa, all right? So this is a difficult environment. You're dealing with corruption everywhere you turn. So somebody needs to really look at that very closely. Uh, I could tell you that, like, you look at the recent success, there's a very significant Hezbollah drug trafficker that was extradited to the Southern District of Florida. All right, so you could do your research and find out more about Mr. Ali, uh, uh, who, was a, who was brought back into Southern District of Florida, I believe, in June, as he was trying to move cocaine from uh, Latin America into France, okay? And we have a lot of different stories. If you look at Amon Juma, the man was indicted for moving $200 million a month through his trade-based money laundering scheme. $200 million a month, okay? And what about the amount of proceeds, right? You're talking about in the indictment, and don't quote me on this because I have to go back and look at it, 88,000 kilograms of cocaine from, a, from the drug cartels in Mexico, that's what he was moving the proceeds of. So these are very serious drug traffickers. And I gotta tell you, as a taxpayer that has three kids, it's very concerning that the, the cars that were moving from the United States to be sold in West Africa for a profit, they're still moving as we sit here today because the U.S. government did not have a whole of government approach. It was done, like I say, one hand behind the back, one hand covering the eye, and one leg. We need the whole body. We need everybody's participation, but that will only happen if the leadership makes that decision. If this is a serious threat, they're chanting death to America, let's go, okay? So the thing is, is drug trafficking, it's not just drug trafficking, it's extortion. It's human smuggling, it's sex trafficking, it's, it's diamond smuggling, it's anything to make a buck. And I got news for you, Lebanese organized crime groups are very good at that. And by the way, let's talk about technology. Do you know what it's like for law enforcement in the United States to go after these people when they use a sophisticated, encrypted technology to communicate? We are in the dark. You understand the significance of that? We are in the dark when we can't infiltrate communications. So we have our hands full, but thanks to groups like this and Chairman Royce's support, I mean, I think we can make a lot of progress, but, you know, again, it's all about the money, and drug trafficking is is producing a lot of money around the world. And, and John, if I can turn to you, uh, Derek in his uh, case against the Lebanese Canadian Bank, he used Section 311 of the Patriot Act. Uh, that same section you, you uh, bring up in your recent foreign affairs uh, piece to target Hezbollah-controlled areas uh, in Lebanon and to isolate financial entities uh, for the party in South Lebanon, in Bekaa, uh, in, uh, in Dahye, the Beirut suburb. I mean, how would that work? And uh, would Congress do this? Would the administration have just walk us through this? Sure. Thank, thanks, Joyce. So um, this was a piece that I wrote with my colleagues, uh, Ord Kittry and Alex Entz, um, for Foreign Affairs that came out last week. And um, look, the, the debate is, is as follows. There, there is actually a real question as to whether uh, Hezbollah has infected Lebanon beyond repair. Uh, that when you look at the LAF, for example, the recent operations that it conducted with Hezbollah, with, in coordination with Hezbollah, it raises questions about whether the, the, the Lebanese army should uh, continue to receive assistance from, uh, from the United States. There is the ongoing question of the banks in Lebanon, as you mentioned, the Lebanese Canadian Bank, I think, was just one example. Uh, and of course, Hezbollah responded to, to, these, uh, to, to these sorts of actions with the bombing of Blom Bank, um, and, and one gets a sense that Hezbollah has um, 
uh, the country by the jugular, uh, politically, militarily, financially. And so the question now becomes, how does one separate out the good from the bad? Right, you heard Chairman Royce talking about how you know you have Hezbollah in the room, even as they're talking about trying to salvage the financial system, and this is a this is a significant problem. And so uh, my, my colleagues and I were thinking about how one could do that, and and you can certainly impose 311 uh, of the Patriot Act on banks, but there is also a, uh, the ability to uh, to invoke 311 on jurisdictions. What's interesting about the law is it doesn't define exactly what a jurisdiction is. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a state. It doesn't have to be a defined border. We could, for example, take a look at satellite photos, look at um, uh, checkpoints. We could look at um, areas that we know are fully controlled by Hezbollah. Right? You mentioned Dahia, uh, the southern suburb of Beirut. You could look at areas of South Lebanon, at Bekaa Valley, areas where Hezbollah has been known to operate, and you can isolate them. You can declare that any transaction that takes place in these territories would be uh, against U.S. law and effectively block them from accessing the U.S. financial system and, in effect, block other financial institutions from even wanting to go near them because of how toxic they would be. The easiest way to sort of sum this up is that it's chemotherapy for Lebanon. You have a cancer within the country right now, and no one knows how to separate good from bad. This process could potentially target uh, the, uh, the sort of illness within Lebanon uh, known as Hezbollah. But then how do you avoid not punishing, you know, just average Lebanese Shia who, ha who just happen to be in, in, in that area? I, I don't think you can, uh, but I think the alternative is to uh, allow Lebanon to continue to go in the direction that it's going now. In other words, if you continue to let things go as they are, you're going to see Hezbollah take over the country. It's, it, it's, it, it, it is effectively inevitable at this point, given how much power they have in the country and how they're growing, both financially, militarily. I mean, I had an assessment from an Israeli government official who told me that Hezbollah is now more powerful than 90% of the world's militaries. And it's operating inside the state itself. So uh, what you, what, what you want to do is you want to make Hezbollah toxic, not only to the banks, not only to the international community, but you want to make it toxic to the Shia community itself. And so that's why I think this may be one of the last resorts available to us. It's either that or we just write off Lebanon entirely. And there is increasingly a chorus right now uh, of people, analysts, who are calling for it, saying that there's really no way to save Lebanon, so we need to be, start to sanction the entire state cut off the Lebanese military. Um, look, I'm not sure that this 311 measure does ultimately save Lebanon, but I have not seen anyone else try to save the country, and I think that should be our goal. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, on, I mean, what we've heard, one last question to you before we turn to the audience. Uh, Hezbollah's involvement in Syria, in in Iraq, uh, the the drug the drug uh, smuggling, uh, uh, the trafficking. I mean, but uh, the party seems invincible still. I mean, they've they've has their image been uh, been hurt uh, by all of this, and what's the breaking point? Well, I think, I mean, they've sort of withstood a lot, but I don't think all pressure has really been uh, exerted on them, particularly talking about this, this issue that has come up in terms of um, their support, right? Internal, so internal and external support. Um, so we've talked about the criminality, we've talked about Iran, uh, we haven't talked as much about donations. And one way to really get at that would, I think, be sort of uh, leveraging what we know about them. I mean, when Treasury puts out, whether it's Ayman Juma or all these other uh, folks who get designated, right? There's a press release that says, you know, this uh, drug organization or this person's involved with the drugs. Um, and that's sort of, you know, people here, you know, on the Hill and at Treasury, right? Like, we, we know this. We understand this. I don't think we, um, as, a, as a country, I don't think we play that up enough, right? So think about, I mean, Hezbollah's been involved in drugs for a while, but they got involved or they justified it by, by getting one of their clerics to, to give a fatwa, a secret 
fatwa which said, hey, it's okay to sell uh, drugs to, to, to non-Muslims in the West. So they took that. They kept it secret. They didn't broadcast that as justification, but they took that and they ran with it. Um, and so everything that we've seen now has evolved from that, and they've denied it. They, to this day, deny that they're involved in drugs. So for me, that means that one of the sort of talking points or just you know key messaging points that, that we need to um, amplify is their role as a criminal organization, selling drugs, doing things that according to their sort of you know Islamist and, and, and moralistic messaging, they'd say uh, would be off limits. But we need to bring out that contradiction, and maybe that could put a dent in some of the, uh, the local support and, and uh, dent their image. Excellent. And in the, uh, okay, I guess we have five minutes to uh, Q&A. Uh, so Derek, I'll, I'll just ask you more questions on, uh, uh, the, I mean, wh where do you see, okay, wh what are exact measures that you would recommend the administration takes immediately to, uh, to improve either its, uh, uh, you know, uh, like working uh, system, working apparatus in targeting Hezbollah, or, or just sanctions? Okay, so you need a financial task force immediately, okay? We have one at the Counter Narcoterrorism Center. The FBI and other agencies have similar operations that need to be kind of working more together, all right? You have to have the resources. You need resources to go after this enemy of the United States, right? It must be a priority, right? That's the key. We can have all the papers in the world, we can have all the discussions, but you need action, right? 9-11 Commission highlighted all this information sharing uh, failures that were going on. They're still going on, okay? They're still going on, and I have a lot of stories about information sharing failures where people are dying because of lack of accountability in that area. So you need, you need accountability on leadership for information sharing. Uh, you have to have the expertise, right? There's one of the things I'd like to highlight is when we did the entire action against the LCB, we had a former IRS uh, investigator that helped us, you know, walk us through the global movement of money. DEA as an agency, we, we, we don't have that institutional expertise. So we need contract support and my folks from Special Operations Command and other entities that helped us understand the movement of monies in, in this incredible network. Uh, but you also have to listen to some of the best U.S. government leaders that we've ever had. General Kelly, Admiral Stavridis, and of course, one of my favorite, Admiral McRaven at SOCOM. They actually have been looking at this evolve for so many years. And I was given a slide back in 2007 with a fireball by Admiral Stavridis, which will, I'll never forget. When the Attorney General asked me what keeps me up at night, it's that fireball. All right, so we need to listen to the experts that studied this. They don't just testify at con Congress and put out bad information. They understand what was happening in their region. So you need to start looking. I wrote a paper, and I'm not the greatest writer in the world. I tried hard to write a paper on the lessons learned in the Lebanese Canadian Bank investigation. And, and the senator, like I said, wrote a finding that it was a great model for interagency cooperation and moving forward. Let's take some successes. Take the lessons learned, listen to the expertise, not just government officials, but leadership, uh, business leaders, and folks that work around the world to kind of put these things together. But you need action. That's the most important message. Let's stop with the government interagency meetings to pontificate for, you know, a week straight without any action. When is somebody going to be asked about results? And that's kind of like one of my main messages. You know, you have to have the results. Do you know, like, some of the stuff I follow is like, Forget the drugs for a second. What about all this illegal immigration coming into the tri-border region where they're trying to get them visas to get into the U.S.? What about some of the cases, like CNN was reporting a story, and I don't know, you know the details too much, but these 173 Venezuelan passports, they were trying to get people these passports. Well, what are they doing? What's their movement going to be, right? So th it's a lot bigger than just drug trafficking. It's, it's all of this criminal activity, and I want to steal uh, uh, Chairman Royce's line, it's a full-time criminal enterprise. That's what it is. So let's treat it as an enterprise like that. You know, I always say you can't work terrorism in a cocoon. If they're a terrorist organization, but they're a criminal network, you have to work it as a criminal network. And that's what there's some unbelievable investigators in the United States and Europe and other places that we can work together and, and make this, uh, you know, 
you know, much safer America. I mean, you, you have to bring people together and let's stop with the bureaucracy, let's stop with the battling over turf, because people are dying. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go to Q&A now. Please just make sure you do have uh, a question. Uh, we're gonna go here to uh, Mr. Harvey. Yeah, I would, oh, Derek Harvey here, and I was most recently at the White House. Um, I would second Derek's comments. That's what we saw there very clearly. And his recommendations are things we need to take action on. And Jonathan's comments about, uh, I, the way we phrase it is Hezbollah is in fact the state and we continue to look at Hezbollah through a terrorism soda straw and it impedes our ability to get an interagency process forward. So, you know, given that, um, it's a, is it a cultural mindset here within the government looking at and self-limiting our approach? Because when we looked at, look at the cash transfers to Hezbollah from Iran, that money gets laundered into the system through hundreds of enterprises. And you need bandwidth and capability to go after it and recognize their tradecraft and what they're doing. So how, uh, what would be your recommendations beyond what you said already, Derek and Jonathan, to go forward? Because I, I would second everything you've already said. Uh, I could say that, you know, we also did uh, 311 sanctions against some of the uh, money exchange houses, which I know got their attention. One thing that was fascinating to me, like, when we hit the Lebanese Canadian Bank with the 311 action, they moved their funds because they didn't want the U.S. to go after the funds. They moved their funds to other banks all around Lebanon. But then we used the 981K action and took the monies because what was happening is another bank in Lebanon, Lebanon Banco Frances, was using United States corresponding accounts, right? Moving monies into the U.S. So what did we do? The great work of the Southern District of New York put a 981K action on the corresponding banks. They couldn't move the money. After a day or two, the lawyers called from Lebanon and said, what are you guys doing? We can't move our money. What do we need to do? Just send the check to the U.S. Marshals account. 150 million came that day. It's very powerful. So we need to increase those kind of efforts and get the expertise that understand how to do this and do it in a very smart way and a calculating way without just kind of, like we say, wing it, you know? We need a comprehensive game plan with action and accountability. Look, okay, I, I would, uh, first of all, thank you for, for everything that you've done, Derek. Um, big fan. Um, what, I, uh, what I would say is, number one, I think w we need to revisit this idea of 311 within, uh, within Lebanon and not just with individual banks when you see it, as I've described, and, and there, the article that I've written is outside. It's a kind of a rough game plan, but I'm more than willing to talk to anyone here if you'd like to follow up on how this could be uh, applied. Um, part of the problem is that the banks inside Lebanon themselves are either in in denial or they're denying what's going on. And we've had conversations at FTD with various banks from Lebanon, senior officials that have come through our office, and, and I think they're actually very good at um, targeting the accounts of Hezbollahis that have been identified to them by the U.S. government or by other authorities or perhaps even in, in the public realm, but they're not proactive in this process, that they're not actively trying to root out Hezbollah from within Lebanon, and this is ultimately the big problem. Uh, so you have this growing infection and more needs to be done. Um, the other thing that I would just note if you're talking about actions that can or should be taken, I, I would recommend that everyone here take a look at the work of my colleague Emanuele Otolenghi uh, from FDD. He's done terrific work on Latin America uh, and the confluence of uh, crime, narco-terrorism, uh, Iran and Hezbollah. This is a, a significant area that I think is only, we're just beginning to scratch the surface. Yes, we have seen uh, people like Ayman Juma uh, 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 go down and uh, we've seen uh, actions taken against him, but I think there are probably many more like him out there. Uh, one of the things that Emanuele was telling me was that, uh, so we know that 830 million or so out of that billion dollar budget comes from Iran. So that means that the rest of the budget comes from elsewhere. So you've got at least 170 million dollars out there uh, that come from criminal sources. I think the bulk of which probably do stem from Latin America from this criminal enterprise. So it means that I think we need to <coughs> redirect. I think we have really two 
maybe three fronts to look at. There's the Lebanese front, and that's kind of a bureaucratic action. Then you've got the Iran sanctions front, which I think we really need to start to think more. Uh, I mean, I think there's already a review going on, but I would very much like to see the administration crack down more on Iran for its involvement in financing Hezbollah. And then that third prong would be focusing on Latin America because it is such a rich uh, resource for this Lebanese terrorist organization. Yeah, yeah, I want to follow up very quickly, and then maybe we take two questions at a time because we have very limited time. Uh, so I'll just ahead. be real quick to actually say something relating to uh, the perspective of uh, when someone is a line analyst within government, a counterterrorism analyst. And um, of course, I left government you know, a few years, several years ago, so a lot of my knowledge is historical. But um, I can say when I was a counterterrorism analyst, right, and I'm not even following the money, but just CT work. Um, so I was. I dealt with Sunni jihadist groups, you know, Sunni extremism and, and Al Qaeda, and you know there is a dividing line between, you know, at least at the time, people following Sunni jihadism and those, you know, and, and following Shia groups. Um, so there's a there's a bubble. If you're if all of the sort of analytic, uh, you know, resources and expertise uh, often doesn't get shared um, because hey, you don't follow Hezbollah, you're focused on AQ or IS, and you know, hopefully that. That's changing a little bit, but I, you know, I'd, I'd say that that's a, 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 an actual structural change that has to happen. Um, analysts who follow, uh, you know, the Sunni groups need to be engaging and at least having lessons learned, uh, connecting with with uh, folks following Hezbollah. Excellent. Uh, so we're gonna go here and then here, take two questions and then circle back. Hi, my name is Gretchen Peters, and um, I had a qu quick comment and then a, and then a question. Um, I wanted to comment that I think there's been, just to follow up on what Special Agent Malth said, there's, there's been a total failure um, that I've seen in the U.S. government, and I, and I hope it's going to change, to actually put together a, a strategy to both strategically understand these, these um, networks from soup to nuts, and then to destroy each aspect of, of what they're doing. I think what we've seen um, is a lot of tactics masquerading as strategy, and there's been a, there's been a total failure to actually understand um, the wide range of activities they're involved in. You mentioned in, um, Hezbollah in Africa and their involvement in sex trafficking, drugs. They're also involved in wide-scale resource extraction, from timber to illegal mining. They're making huge amounts of money from this, and we're just leaving all of that money on the table by not even examining it. It's low-hanging fruit. Um, and I want to ask, I, I haven't had the time to review the, be the bill uh, that Chairman Royce has put forward, but I wonder if, if that bill includes uh, any resources to go to doing both that investigative work, but also to putting together the type of task force that you're talking about um, that would actually go in and, and um, take action. Thank you. Next question there. Yes, uh, I was wondering if you could please comment on kind of like the second order effects on some of these policies. You know, I hear uh, a lot of tough talk, um, and that it sounds very good, but I'm wondering if you guys could entertain maybe kind of secondary reactions on the ground in southern Lebanon um, a little bit more in terms of uh, the Arab Shia. Uh, live there. And also, if you could please elaborate on um, the Latin you, American. Can you introduce connection? yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Zach Wilkinson. <laughs> Um, and also, if you could please um, comment on the Latin American connection, something I'm not as familiar with. Are these drugs coming from Colombia and then b they're being filtered through um, Venezuela? Or could you please comment on that, please? Okay. Uh, John, maybe you take the first question on the HIFPAC uh, 2. Uh, if, if that legislation has any of the measures we've been speaking about. Uh, and then maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, Derek can take the second question. Sure. Um, as I understand it, HIPAA 2, along with HIPAA 1, um, empowers the U.S. government to target uh, uh, any um, uh, entity that is known to be supporting Hezbollah, any state actor, any individual abroad. So you have, I think, broad authorities uh, to target uh, Africa. I don't think it's identified. I don't recall it being identified. Having read it last night again, I don't recall there being any specific uh, reference to Africa, but certainly doesn't exclude uh, authorities to be able to pursue uh, targets there. Um, as for the question of uh, South Lebanon, which I assume was directed uh, at my kind of 311 idea, um, I think the point here is that uh, the Shia in uh, South Lebanon or elsewhere would certainly not be happy. Uh, 
but the challenge here is that, so you will certainly see sectarian tensions rise as a result of this. You'll have Shia who claim that they're being targeted unfairly. Uh, but at the end of the day, if they are living within territory that is identified as Hezbollah controlled, and there are significant portions of Lebanon that now have, there's no choice but to identify them as Hezbollah controlled because you have Hezbollah businesses scattered throughout, you've got Hezbollah forces, checkpoints and the like, it's very hard to deny that something needs to be done. If you have territory now that is fully controlled by a terrorist organization, uh, what choice do you have but to acknowledge it as such? If you, if you fail to acknowledge that, then what you have is the seeding of these parts of Lebanon and the potential for it to grow. So I, I certainly don't want to convey the idea that somehow this is going to be easy and that we should gloss over the challenges that would come from a deeply fractured Lebanon. It's already fractured as we know and it's not getting any less so. Uh, but I think if what we're trying to do is to salvage the country from the control of Hezbollah, and that really should be the goal right now, uh, because otherwise you have, again, chorus, a chorus right now of analysts are saying there is no saving Lebanon, which means that it's going to get a lot worse in terms of sanctions and the like. So the idea here is to take a half measure if that's possible. It will create tensions, but I think those tensions are far more palatable compared to what the alternative is. Um, as for Latin America, I would actually, um, I, I'd love it if uh, my colleague Emanuele can, could talk about it a little bit, but I understand that Paraguay has become a significant jurisdiction uh, for the Latin American activities uh, of Hezbollah. His work, I think, is certainly <laughs> worth reading on this, but it's not limited to Paraguay. We just know that that's one of the significant areas. So with drug trafficking, just keep in mind that it's worldwide. And yet, historically, you know, in Colombia, the Colombian cartels uh, have dominated, you know, the production. You know, you have production in, in other areas of the southern cone, like Peru and other places. But Venezuela, over the last several years, has been a command and control hub for the movement of cocaine worldwide, not just into the U.S., but all over, you know, Europe and other parts of the world and, you know, West Africa, of course, as a transshipment point. Um, you, you also have, as you know, in this country, we have a fentanyl crisis, right? You have a crisis where kids are dropping everywhere because they're taking these pills and fentanyl. They have no idea what they're taking. And a lot of that stuff is coming through Mexico and Central America. And the chemicals are coming from Asia in a lot of cases, okay? And so you have just this convergence of people that are looking to make money. And they're going to make money any way they can. I mean, again, I'm not a statistics guy, but the UN said, what is it, $400 billion have been generated by drugs. But as Gretchen said, that's just a drop in a bucket. There's so many things that we don't even know about. Do you think I had the expertise on lumber and all the other stuff she was talking about? So it's just an overwhelming, complex series of criminal activities that we need to have the experts. And I repeat, experts. And they're not in the government, by the way. The government has some tremendous people. I love the people that I worked with. I hated leaving, but it's experts. Some of them are sitting in this room, and some of them ask questions that can come into a room and, and put out a strategy and then just implement the strategy, right? If it makes sense, let's go with it. It's a lot better than what we have now. And, and, and you know, the most important point that I'd like to leave with is the fact that you can have all the strategies in the world. If you do not have an implementation plan, you might as well rip up the strategy. And I'll give you the example. 2011, President Obama, he, he let a very good strategy out on transnational organized crime. Guess what? 2017, President Trump, another strategy. When are we going to have implementation? And it's almost identical. And you know what? The strategies are great. Because the interagency all participated. The experts came in the room. They laid on the table things that make a lot of sense. But when is somebody going to get in the room and say, okay, implement the strategy? When is the taxpayer going to stand up and say, what are we doing with all these strategies? Yeah. Inspector General reports. How many more do we need? Uh, okay. I guess we'll take a final uh, round of questions. If you, okay, let's go uh, here and then. <coughs> My question, oh, this is Kurt Mills from the National Interest Magazine, and my question is for Dr. Shanzer. Um, you referenced this before, um, this isn't about the narco-terrorism, about what a 
military option for a post-ISIL Iraq would look like, or uh, post-ISIL Syria would look like. Can you talk about a little bit of what you meant by that and elaborate? Sure. I, I mean, uh, look, I should preface anything that I say here by saying that I'm not a, uh, an expert on military affairs. Um, I think there is obviously debate going on uh, within uh, within the White House about what the role is for the U.S. government post uh, uh, post ISIS uh, inside Syria and to a certain extent Iraq. Uh, there is the concern of uh, an Iranian slash Hezbollah slash Shia militia takeover of significant territories lost uh, by ISIS, and more specifically, the concern is uh, the so-called land bridge that you have this ability by uh, uh, Iran to extend its military presence either through its own forces, through Hezbollah, or through Shia forces from Iraq into Syria all the way to uh, to the Golan Heights right on Israel's doorstep. The idea being uh, that you'd be able to mobilize forces, be able to use uh, uh, routes by land to transfer materiel um, as opposed to flying them in, which of course they're doing through um, uh, through uh, th um, uh, through Mahan Air, uh, Airlines and, and others. Uh, but so the concern here is is that uh, Iran's going to take over or they're going to take over enough that would be uh, a strategic advantage for them to be able to extend their hegemony throughout the rest of the Middle East that we will have effectively ceded Syria to uh, 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 to the Iranians. That is That should not be uh, the final outcome uh, of, of this war in Syria, but it certainly appears that we're heading that way. I have heard certain uh, strategies conveyed to me by folks in, in relatively senior positions talking about hitting specific choke points uh, along the, this so-called land bridge, uh, specifically along the Syria-Iraq border, that there were areas that you could target. Uh, there's, of course, the reports of a U.S. drone targeting uh, some of the assets of the Iranian Axis. That may continue to, to happen, uh, but I think the idea here is that there should at least be select targets along the way to ensure that Iran doesn't inherit the Middle East as a result of this six, seven year struggle. Uh, John, can I follow up uh, on this? I mean, how, how problematic is this uh, situation for uh, Israel now having Hezbollah in southern Syria and in, in, in southern uh, Lebanon? Uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, perhaps uh, sanctioning areas, neighborhoods in, in South Lebanon, but you also now have neighborhoods in, in Aleppo and in uh, Damascus that are also controlled by Hezbollah. So how complex is this picture for, for Israel? And do you foresee another uh, big confrontation? Um. So the answer is it's very complex, and yes, we see a big confrontation. It's really a question of when. I mean, I mean when, when I speak to Israeli officials about the challenge of Hezbollah, um, it, it's been kind of a, a, let's just say it's been a mixed bag. I mean, there was a time where I would go and, and speak to Israeli officials five, six years ago and ask them about the conflict in Syria, and the response was sort of like, well, this is sort of a fun movie, Alien versus Predator. You've got al-Qaeda and ISIS fighting against Hezbollah and the Assad Assad regime, uh, you kind of want to you know, kick back and open up a bag of popcorn. Um, over time, of course, it's become far more complex. And I think the Israelis have uh, come to the understanding that uh, ultimately somebody has to win this battle. And ultimately, it looks right now that it's going to be the Assad regime maintaining uh, most of the control of these territories. Uh, the, the, I think there are several challenges. Number one is uh, the rocket arsenal, which has increased at least threefold the estimates are somewhere between 150 to 180,000 rockets, all facing south at Israel, some of them more uh, advanced than others, some of them rocket-guided, precision-guided, et cetera. These are things that uh, the Israelis are going to have a tough time countering, even with their advanced uh, 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 missile defense systems. You have now the problem of this sort of pincer action, where you have Hezbollah uh, in southern Lebanon, as you mentioned, as well as on the Syrian side, where Hezbollah has 
uh, replicated itself, where it has created um, uh, rock, it's installed rocket arsenals, where it has entrenched positions, and they're preparing for potentially a two-front action against Israel, drawing Israel into a war that it has only tried to shape from afar through medical treatment and the like. Uh, so you have that. And then there's just the overall challenge of the rocket-making facilities that we've discussed here today, both in Lebanon as well as in Syria. My colleague colleague Mark Dubowitz, CEO of FDD, has written about this with Congressman Mike Gallagher, uh, that uh, the Lebanese citizens, and to a certain extent, I, I suppose Syrians as well, are going to be human shields uh, in the next conflict, and that there would be significant collateral damage. So the Israelis are thinking about that and how to fight a war along the lines uh, that we expect, where they are going to be vilified for just even responding to rocket attacks from civilian territories. So the next war is going to be very complicated. We're obviously, I mean, in, in terms of timetables, I, I, I think we're probably overdue for, for a next round. I think probably one of the main reasons that, that uh, you don't see Hezbollah rushing to battle is that it is still deployed heavily inside Syria, and that you've seen the body bags of some 1,500 or more Hezbollah He's coming back to Lebanon. This has not been um, a ter terribly popular war for the Shia in Lebanon. But at a certain point, the war will wind down. You will have battle-hardened Hezbollah fighters returning to Lebanon, and they will be looking for their next front. And you have to, of course, remember that Hezbollah was not created to fight a war in Syria. It was, f it was created to fight a war against Israel. So it is an inevitability. It's just a question, I think, now of how much Hezbollah will have in its possession in terms of arms, in terms of capabilities, and also don't forget that they've been getting some assistance from the Russians as well. So they have uh, better intelligence and better training. So these are some of the, the significant challenges that the Israelis are weighing as they think about the next round. We're going to go to the gentleman. He's been very patient waiting. Uh, uh, Ken Timmerman, very sobering, Jonathan. Uh, m my question is for Derek and Yahya. Uh, you have spoken quite a bit about uh, cocaine moving from Latin America to around the world, to West Africa and then all to Australia and other places. Can you, uh, do you see evidence that the Iranian regime is itself directly engaged in drug smuggling? And I'm thinking specifically of bringing in either opium poppies from uh, Afghanistan through the Taliban or uh, already uh, transformed drugs from Afghanistan and then shipping it out to the rest of the world. Do you see any evidence that the Iranian regime itself is directly involved there? Thank you. Go ahead. I mean, again, I've been out of the DEA for like three years, but in talking to people, because uh, I remain involved every single day, this is what I, I actually live for this. Um, and yes, there is evidence of movement of drugs around the world. And it, I guess it depends on how you define the Iranian regime. The way I define it is Hezbollah is a big component of Iran and Hezbollah around the world is operating like a major drug cartel. I hope that answered the question. The IRDC, for example. Okay, you're going to have to ask the experts around the Beltway in regard to that. I can only tell you that uh, I'll never forget the case that the FBI cracked with the DEA when they approached a DEA informant in Texas to do all kinds of devastating activities in our country, in D.C., in going after the ambassador, I think, uh, in, in South America. You guys are probably more aware of that than I am. So, yeah, they approached a major drug trafficker that they thought had capabilities to do devastating acts in the U.S. We actually, and um, so I, again, I, I don't follow uh, Iran's drug activity, you know, uh, per se, outside of Hezbollah, um, but, you know, I do want to reference uh, one of our experts, probably one who knows the most about Iran and IRGC and smuggling and trafficking, Emmanuel Otulengi, um, who's with FDD and who's, who's here. So I'm sure I'll put you all together and, uh, and, and he could uh, touch base with you. And, and looking at uh, Emmanuel's work uh, as well. There's Emmanuel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just helping out. Uh, uh, yeah, I want to ask you something, and the report actually was very interesting. You mentioned the 
new Gulf sanctions from the GCC on, on Hezbollah and uh, being coordinated with the U.S. also as a new uh, approach, a new uh, vehicle to, to just squeeze Hezbollah. Why is that effective? So, so I don't know if it's effective yet. I think so. Uh, so what we were, what, what we wanted to point out in the in our report, uh, you know, an array of ways, different action points that different actors so uh, could could. Uh, could do in order to to target Hezbollah's finances. And what we were pointing out is, so just recently, um, Saudi stood up this uh, uh, counterterrorism uh, targeting center, counterterror finance targeting center, right? Brand new, that's the thing with the globe and, and the president, right, uh, a few months ago. And so, um, so is that going to be effective? Right. I'm not saying it's uh, it's effective yet. What we were saying is, okay, if we were going to set this up, right, let's not uh, just let it be for show and to show these computer screens and, and all of that, right? We have very sig we have significant expertise and experience in doing interagency work here in the U.S., right? So obviously, Treasury has folks deployed to this counterterrorism finance center in Riyadh, and our suggestion is, okay, put some beef to it. Don't just you know have you know a, a few Treasury analysts. Um, get DEA, get the whole sort of the interagency, the collaborative effort that we've used, that should actually be a model for what folks in the region do to target. Because you can't just say, oh, we're targeting Hezbollah finances and, you know, maybe you know, deal with a couple of banks that you politically don't like or whatever. Um, deal with the whole enterprise that we've been talking about, this whole of, of government approach that we're saying that that should be exported um, and that the U.S. Should, should bring that model to the region to the centers that are supposed to be charged with countering Hezbollah if, if, if such an effort is going to have any weight. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience or should I just... Uh, then I'll, uh, I'll actually keep, uh, keep going. So, uh, but, but before that, I mean, John, maybe you've... Oh, actually, we do have a question here. Hi, uh, Josh Cohen uh, with Congressman Deutsch's office, ranking member on the Middle East Subcommittee. First of all, thank you, FDD, for another amazing event. Um, let me ask a quick question in terms of what we can do in terms of putting more pressure on Hezbollah. My boss has authored a resolution urging the EU to designate Hezbollah in, in its entirety as a terrorist organization. As you know, for a long time they were unwilling to designate it at all. I think the bus bombing in Bulgaria probably had a huge impact on them finally making a designation, but they artificially distinguish between a political and a military element of Hezbollah. And my question is, one, what do you see as the implications of them actually making the full designation? And two, can you speak to the EU's argument that they've been making for a long time that if they do a full designation, it'll have significant legal implications in terms of their ability to help Syrian refugees in Lebanon and other uh, involvement with the Lebanese political system. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take the first crack at this. Uh, look, first of all, uh, the, this attempt to distinguish between the, the military and the political wing, I mean, it's the same argument that we've heard with, uh, uh, with regard to uh, Hamas, uh, which I, you know, ultimately the Europeans relented on that. I think it's, uh, it, I, it, it actually mirrors a lot of the discussion that we have right now within the Iranian government as well, as if somehow uh, the supreme leader doesn't rule the country along with the IRGC and that somehow there, there is a, a more of a moderate faction, even though it's subservient to the supreme leader. So what we have is, uh, a, you know, a, a continuing debate. I think it does get right back to the heart of the issue that I was raising earlier, that if you start to designate Hezbollah in its, enti in its entirety, then you start to question the role of Hezbollah in the Lebanese government. You start to wonder about whether the Lebanese government itself is infected beyond repair. And this is what I think the Europeans don't want to have to come face to face with. It's what we're struggling with right now as we uh, weigh our options with regard to the LAF and, and to other assistance that we may provide to Lebanon. It actually raises on comfortable questions about the UN uh, and, uh, and UNIFIL, for that matter. We, I know we just recently uh, re-upped uh, the mandate of UNIFIL, but there are real questions about whether there's even uh, political will to, to track Hezbollah uh, and, and its uh, ability to arm up inside Lebanon. So this is really the challenge here. It's, it's about coming face to face with the fact that Hezbollah has uh, 
uh, has usurped territory and power inside of Lebanon and a question of how to, uh, if it's not sanctions, I don't know what, uh, what other means there are available to the Europeans or to us. And I think, you know, again, I, I mean, maybe I should just say that um, uh, my colleague Tony Badran uh, from FDD has been really out front on this. He's talked about how Lebanon, I mean, he's gone, I think, farther than a lot of people where he's saying that Lebanon is lost, but he has explained why he thinks that's the case. I'm not quite ready to cede that yet, and it appears the Europeans aren't either, but I would, I would urge the Europeans to, to take that final measure and to designate uh, both wings, I mean, they don't really exist, but to designate Hezbollah in its entirety, and then to begin to take action to, um, to remediate. I think it's probably the best way of putting it, inside Lebanon. This is the big challenge ahead of us right now. If we're trying to eradicate or weaken Hezbollah, you're gonna have to figure out who the good guys are, and you're going to have to differentiate between the two. Um, I think we're running out of time, but very quickly, just, just, just specifically on: Is it a fair argument they make that they're not going to be able to support Syrian refugees in Lebanon if they designate Hezbollah? I mean, they, they designated Hamas in its entirety, and they still send aid to Palestinian refugees. So, is that a real argument? Look, I think the question is whether Hezbollah is the, the, the primary actor behind the, um, the humanitarian organizations that, uh, that handle the refugee flows. Um, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, yes, there are mechanisms to be able to work around this. We see it right now uh, in, is in Israel for example, that they're taking assistance from the Turks and the Qataris, processing it through an Israeli uh, aid uh, agency, and then making sure, most of the time anyway, that the aid gets to the right people. I think that you could probably do something similar in the case of Lebanon, but again, the problem is, how do you identify the right actors? How do you identify the white channels, the right banks, the right agencies? This has been the problem because we've not been willing or able um, to have a debate about who the good guys are and who is affiliated with Hezbollah, um, the so-called political branch or the military. So this, I think we need to have uh, a definition of terms first before we create that mechanism, which I think is very possible. Uh, so in the last uh, two minutes uh, we have, I'd like just to ask a final uh I guess I'm not gonna ask, a, uh, not gonna give you guys closing, any room for closing remarks. We're just gonna uh, welcome Congressman uh, Engel to, to the panel to conclude uh, uh, what has been a very uh, enthusing and exciting, though sobering discussion. Okay, I'm putting on my other hat and introducing the Congressman again. I keep taking them off and putting them on. Uh, so we welcome Congressman Elliot Engel, ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, he's committed to working across the political aisle with Chairman Royce and others. He has authored many bills in Congress addressing the challenges of terrorism. He is the author of the Syria Accountability and Lebanese Sovereignty Restoration Act of 2003. He was an original co-sponsor of the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Act, which became law. He is also an original co-sponsor of the new legislation which builds on HIFPA and expends, extends pressure on Hezbollah's global financing network, including its chief patron, Iran. In introducing the bill, he said, Congress must close any possible loophole that could allow foreign funding of Hezbollah, acting swiftly in a bipartisan manner. It will show uh, Hezbollah's foreign sponsors that the United States will not sit by while Hezbollah grows stronger. Couldn't agree more. We're honored to work with you, Congressman Engel, and your very capable staff on a multitude of national security issues, and we welcome you here today. Thank you very much. Nice, nice spread. I would have had, wouldn't have had breakfast at my previous uh, engagement if I <laughs> knew this was coming. But uh, should have known you were a class act, right? Um, thank you very much, Jonathan, and, and uh, um, thanks to all of you. Um, I'm grateful to the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies for hosting this event and for all of you who join us this morning. Uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Chairman Royce and I try to work together. I think we're probably more successful than, than almost any other committee in, uh, in the Congress uh, trying to conduct things in a bipartisan fashion. It doesn't mean we ag always agree on everything, but uh, foreign policy ought to be bipartisan and um, fighting should, should, should stop at the water's edge. Uh, when we uh, go uh, to on delegations overseas, 
Um, it doesn't really matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Um, what, what matters is we are representing America. And um, when it comes to um, terrorist organizations and, and threats, um, th this is something that we really have to work together and, and, and unite together. So uh, Chairman Royce and I believe that where there's differences of opinion, we try to iron them out. But uh, we find when we iron them out, you know, we, we don't have much much difference. Um, a perfect example was in the summer of 2013, um, we passed a um, sanctions bill on Iran, uh, which passed uh, out of the Foreign Affairs Committee unanimously. That means not one negative vote. It was a pretty extensive bill, and we worked together, and we ch made some changes, and we put people together, and uh, it, it passed the floor with over 400 uh, votes. And I think it's important to do things like that, to show groups like Hezbollah and others that uh, terrorism is not going to be swept under the rug and we're going to have a united uh, fight uh, together. It's really important. When I've led uh, delegations um, to uh, foreign countries, there was very little um, fighting amongst the delegation, Democrats and Republicans, because we, we you know, we're Americans, and um, there is more that unites us, I think, than 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 divides us, and we've always conducted it that way. Um, over a decade ago, it was in 2003, I believe, uh, I authored the Syria Accountability and Lebanese Sovereignty Restoration Act, which is now law. The, this measure uh, aimed to remove Syria from Lebanon, and with it, Syria's support for Hezbollah. Um, since then, Hezbollah has found new ways to siphon resources and expand its reach, all while working toward the same goals, to undermine Lebanese political independence, support Iran's dangerous agenda throughout the region, continue chaos and war in Syria, and threaten Israel's security. Our sanctions laws need to keep pace, and we must always be one step ahead. Now, as we know, Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. That was one of the reasons I, I voted against the uh, Iran Act, the JCPOA. Uh, I had many reasons, but the main two uh, were that Iran is the state sponsor of terrorism with no money and the leading state sponsor of terrorism. And now this, this agreement puts cash in Iran's hand and they can even be more, and will be and are being even more dangerous in terms of supporting terrorism. And finally, uh, the sunset clauses, you know, the, uh, this doesn't prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. It just postpones it for 15 years. And that's worrisome. And now when we're talking about whether or not the president should certify, certainly that 15 years, which is now down to uh, 13 years, is something that's in all of our minds. Um, Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, and while the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and its Quds Force spread instability throughout the region, Iran's most destructive terrorist tool has been Hezbollah. Among other things, this heinous group was behind the bombings of the American Embassy and Marine Barracks in Lebanon, the Israeli Embassy and Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and countless brutal attacks against Israelis, including the tour bus bombing in Bulgaria in 2012. But Hezbollah's nefarious activities are not limited to terrorism. The group has put down roots in drug trafficking and other forms of transnational crime. And of course, Hezbollah has been at the forefront of perpetuating violence and instability in Syria. You know, when uh, 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 Assad was, was losing the war, um, in poured Hezbollah under the watchful eyes of Iran, changing the course of that war. And then when it was happening again, in poured Russia. Um, so uh, Syria, uh, under Assad, has been given a lifeline twice, but Hezbollah and Iran uh, want to see Assad hang on. Um, we know how terrible things are in Syria, you know, I, I, ironically. Um, for the men, women, and children living there, it's ter ter terrible. Weekly attacks in Idlib, chemical attacks perpetuated by the murderous Assad regime. This crisis continues to rage. We, we frankly have been missing in action when we could have gotten uh, rid of Assad a number of years ago. We didn't, we didn't do it. It was a big mistake. Um, this crisis continues to rage, and we know that putting a stop to it will be difficult, and that more time will pass before the Syrian people can achieve the future they deserve. But we cannot change the course of this conflict without understanding a few things. 
Number one, military action alone will not solve this crisis. That's unfortunately uh, come and gone. Only a political trans uh, transition, one that sees the end of the Assad regime, will put the Syrian people on the path towards recovery and rebuilding. Number two, we cannot do this without our senior diplomats in place who can drive the policies that will lead to a solution. It's now October, and the President has yet to nominate an Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, let alone countless other vacancies. It makes no sense to me. I don't understand it. I've raised it again and again. Um, you know, couple that with a 31 percent proposed cut to the State Department, uh, it just to me shows neglect on the part of the administration. Uh, number three, we must go after the Assad regime and its enablers for their campaign of t carnage. This includes going after Moscow and Tehran, who also support Hezbollah. And I'll say that again, Vladimir Putin, who says his forces are in Syria to fight terrorism, is a liar. He's fighting alongside Hezbollah, and it's mind-boggling. Now, I'm a firm believer that we need to do everything we can to isolate Hezbollah, its recruiters, financiers, weapons traffickers, and propagandists, and that's why I'm pleased to be the lead Democrat, uh, Democratic sponsor of Chairman Royce's bill, the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Amendments Act. This legislation updates the Hezbollah sanctions that we passed two years ago to push back against Hezbollah's financial patrons, including Iran. Since then, Russian coordination with Hezbollah has increased, with their support of Hezbollah on a Syrian battlefield. And this, this legislation also targets Hezbollah's fundraising, recruitment, and propaganda activities, as well as those states that are providing weapons, financial, or material support to Hezbollah. Now is the time to choke off Hezbollah's assets, and that's why we must pass this legislation into law. But we can't stop there. We must also discourage our current, the, the current administration from entering into agreements with no coherent strategy that put our greatest allies in the region in danger. And specifically, the Trump administration has negotiated with Moscow to create de-escalation zones on Israel's border, bringing Hezbollah and the IRGC right up against the Golan Heights, in addition to their presence in Lebanon. Um, frankly, I'm, I'm glad that we're paying attention to these issues because we, we, we need to explain to the administration that moving Iran and Hezbollah into Israel's frontier is simply a bad idea. I was recently in Israel and had extensive conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who says that this, this cannot stand. He's very concerned about it, and he will just not let it, let it happen. He's made it known to President Trump. He said the same thing to Vladimir Putin, and uh, I think he's right. Um, so this work has been difficult and will not get any easier, but we must stay in it in Congress, in the White House, in multilateral international institutions, and in the advocacy community. For all those who cling to that hope for a brighter future and strong security in the Middle East and across the globe, that's important. And I thank this organization for its good work and for focusing time and time and time again. We cannot be silent. We have to let Americans and the rest of the world know what is going on. We need to stop uh, Moscow and Tehran and all these places that support uh, international terrorism against the United States, against Israel, against our friends and allies. Um, this cannot stand. So I thank you very much for listening this morning and um, happy to continue to work with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Engel, uh, very much for your comments. Uh, and thank you all for joining us here today for this incredibly important discussion. Uh, these conversations don't end here. If you have any questions or would like additional information on these or other topics, our Congressional Relations team is here and available. My colleagues Tyler Stapleton and Boris Zilberman, I don't know if you guys are still in the room. Uh, there's Boris right there. I guess Tyler might be outside. Please uh, chat with them if you have any questions on follow-up. I also would like to direct your attention to Emanuele, Emanuele Otolenghi, who is our Latin America Hezbollah specialist. Please speak with him if you have any questions about the narco-terrorism nexus. And of course, also speak to my colleague, uh, colleagues Yaya uh, Fanusi and Alex Entz, who recently co-authored this uh, incredibly uh, exhaustive study on Hezbollah finance. Um, and I also want to just finally thank uh, Joyce, uh, as well as Derek and Yaya for being on this panel. And again, thank you mu very much, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Because I believe that when we sign something, we have to fulfill our
organization so that people won't, won't you know, Hey, how you doing? Good. I think it was a terrible mistake. But I think now. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous.